This is one of my most favorite quotes from The Power of Awareness. That which you feel yourself to be, you are. And you are given that which you are. So assume the feeling that would be yours were you already in possession of your wish. And your wish must be realized. So live in the feeling of being the one you want to be and that you shall be. Every feeling makes a subconscious impression. And unless it is counteracted by a more powerful feeling of an opposite nature, it must be expressed. Your feelings are different from your thoughts. Your feelings are what you experience in your body. The dominant of two feelings is the one expressed. I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. I am healthy says I feel healthy and I feel healthy. I feel great. I don't determine if I am well on the basis of what it says on a piece of paper or on the basis of what somebody else out there tells me. I live my life feeling within my body that I am strong, I am capable, I am able. And that is not just something that I say. It's not just an affirmation. An affirmation is an intellectual exercise. This is a spiritual knowing within that I am well, I am content, I am prosperous. But the words that Neville used there are the subconscious. Every feeling that you have makes a subconscious impression upon your body and upon your awareness. Now, you, you need to understand the subconscious mind of yours. Your subconscious mind rules your life. 96 to 97 percent of everything that you do is done as a result of your subconscious mind. And when your subconscious mind gets programmed, it goes ahead and responds to whatever it is your conscious mind has placed into it. I was 18 years old. I was in the United States Navy for four years. And they sent me to a school in Bainbridge, Maryland to become a radioman and a cryptographer. And we spent an hour a day, every day, for the first three or four weeks we were there on a typewriter learning Morse code, okay? And my conscious mind had to program my subconscious mind. Now this subconscious mind of yours is operating all the time. You're sitting here watching a, a, a television show. You got up, you picked up your remote control, you turned the channel on, you got dressed, you ate lunch, you went to the bathroom, you go to work, you get into your car, you drive to work, you, put, you don't think about what I'm gonna do. Everything that is going on in your life, everything, everybody in here in this room, you, know, you got here through your subconscious mind. You didn't have to think about every single thing that you were doing, but there was a time when you did in order to learn that. This habitual subconscious mind of yours rules your life. So I'm 18 years old, I'm taking Morse code. Dit, da, da, here's the alphabet, a little bit of it anyway. Da, 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 you're doing the same thing. Only you don't use Morse code, but you've programmed your subconscious mind with did it, it, da it, I can't do that. Did it, it, da it, that, I'm not very attractive. Did it, it, da it, that, I'm overweight. Did it, it, da da da, da did it, da, I can't do make things happen. And it's did it, it, da da da, da it's still there. 53 years later, you and you go through your life with the subconscious programming, with uh, with an awareness that. You are not in charge. You're not able to extend or transcend this, uh, this way of, of thinking. This subconscious mind of yours is most impacted by your feelings. A change of feeling 
is a change of destiny. A change of feeling is a change of destiny. <clears throat> Write it down. Stick it on the wall next to your bed. If you came into where I sleep, you would see that. I look at that all the time. I want to practice putting into my subconscious mind the assumption of the feeling of what it is that I would like to attract into my life as if it already existed and to feel it, not just to think it, but to feel it. Neville's Law of Assumption says this. If this assumption about what you would like to become is persisted in until it becomes your dominant feeling, the attainment of your ideal is absolutely inevitable. You must first assume the feeling of a wish fulfilled in all aspects of your life. So you have to say to yourself, what does it feel like to be prosperous? What does it feel like to, to be content? What does it feel like to, to be well? I have been accused over the years in the critical press of um, of providing false hope to people. Uh, people will call, and I'll be on a, t a talk show on the radio someplace in the world, and uh, someone will call in who's been diagnosed with a terminal illness of some kind, and I will talk to them about uh, about about not buying into the diagnosis. About you know why would you just listen to a group of people who have a vested interest in uh, in convincing you of uh, of of this impending doom in your life and the the law that has allowed ever, ever allowed any miracle to ever take place in the history of humanity is still on the books it hasn't been repealed so that that energy whatever it is uh, whoever has ever healed themselves of a uh, of a, a diagnosis of terminal illness uh, uh, used the same kind of energy that uh, is in you and so people say well that's providing false hope and so on and i remember um, Again, to speak about Michelangelo, I mean, these people that I, that, that I selected for, or that selected me uh, for Wisdom of the Ages, uh, I feel after studying their lives in depth and, uh, and, and looking at not only what they had to say, but what they were like, I mean, I feel uh, like you're talking about my, my grandfather or something when yes. you speak about Michelangelo. And again, in Florence, um, when, when we went to Florence, uh, I said, I'm just going to go see the Statue of David. And I thought, well, I'll just look at this statue. You know, everybody has to see David. Yes. And I walked in there, and you go through this long corridor, and you see all of these uh, slaves on either side that are coming out of the concrete that were uh, all uh, sculpted by Michelangelo. And then you come into this room that's all lit, and then there's this statue, this magnificent statue, and it's 18 feet high. And um, it is the most astounding uh, thing I've ever seen. And I'm not a big uh, art critic or even going to uh, art shows and sculptures yes. and all that. It's, I, I enjoy it, but it's not something that I have a passion about. Yes. Well, four hours later, Michael, I was still standing in front of that statue. My wife and my three daughters were out there climbing El Duomo and buying shoes and doing all the things that you do when you're in Italy. You're right. And they came back and they said, uh, Dad, come on, come on, we have to leave. And I, I felt like I couldn't, uh, I couldn't leave that place. It was such a beautiful experience. I mean, the, the, you can see every vein in the, uh, you know, in this thing and it's, uh, it's just a magnificent experience. So when they ask, you know, there's this wonderful quote that uh, they ask Michelangelo, how could you have created such a, a, per a perfect uh, specimen of, of sculpture from uh, from one piece of marble? His famous quote is that uh, David was already in the marble. I just chipped away the excess. Yes. You know, and that there's a David inside each and every one of us. Yes. And and this idea of of, of uh, if you're you know the greater danger is not that our hopes are too high and we fail to reach them it's that they are too low and we do and most people see themselves uh, in terms they don't see I, I think you should see yourself as a saint you know and I see I think a person ought to be envisioning themselves as capable of doing anything I think it's possible to excel in every area of life that is, you don't have to sort of restrict yourself to one area. I think you can enjoy going to a National Football League game in the afternoon and going to the ballet in the evening. Yes. And people say, well, you're a speaker, usually speakers, uh, and, you, and you get paid a lot for speaking, so you, uh, usually speakers are not good writers, you know, or because one is introverted and, so, and supposedly and one is extroverted. And
and I have often thought, why can't you be a really fine writer and a great speaker as well? Sure. And why can't you be a great athlete and a poet as well? Why not? And all, most of these people like Goethe and Michelangelo and Da Vinci and, and Shakespeare and, and Pope and so many of these people, like, these were people who were, who were masters at, at a thousand different things. Isn't that interesting? How we like in medicine now. I mean, now you you know you you have a specialist who specializes in the right finger. <laughs> you know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we have hand specialists. We have foot specialists and nose exactly. specialists. And imagine going to school for years and studying only the hand. Yes. You know, whereas uh, here was Da Vinci or Michelangelo, and they studied. You know, they were they were anatomists. I mean, they studied anatomy uh, and were medical people. You know, they study, the way that Michelangelo learned about uh, you know how to how to do sculpture was by uh, examining cadavers they would they would literally steal the cadavers and go through and he would examine them and the, you know it's like when you when you discover the the greatness that's in in yourself uh you know and and not re restricting yourself in any way and not enough of us can think of ourselves as being able to be to excel in all areas and to have high hopes about virtually everything because high hopes is not just a song that Frank Sinatra sang with a bunch of kids high hopes is is uh, being able to visualize and see for yourself what it is that you'd like to uh, be able to accomplish in your life Every single person on the planet has within them the potential to be a healer. In order to make conscious contact with your inherent healing powers, you must first make the decision to be healed yourself. Reconnect to the disease-free, loving perfection from which you came is a succinct statement of what self-healing process requires. The universal mind of intention knows precisely what you need in order to optimize your health. What you must do is notice your thoughts and your behaviors which are creating resistance and interfering with healing which is the flow of intentional energy. Recognizing your resistance is something that's entirely up to you. That source is never focused on what's wrong, what's missing, or even what's sickly. True healing takes you back to the source. Anything short of this connection is just a temporary fix. When you clean up the connecting link to your source, attractor patterns of energy are drawn to you. If you don't believe that this is possible, then you've created resistance to your intention to heal and to be healed. If you believe that it is possible, but not for you, then you have more resistance. If you believe that you're being punished by the absence of health, that's also resistance. These inner thoughts about your ability to be healed play a dominant role in your physical experience. Becoming a healer by healing oneself involves another one of those imaginary somersaults into the inconceivable where you land upright and balanced in your thoughts, face to face with your source. You realize, perhaps for the first time, that you and your source are one when you let go of the ego mind, which has convinced you that you're separate from the power of intention. From thoughts of sickness to intentions of wellness. The decision to create is the decision to intend. To create healing, you can't have thoughts of illness and anticipate your body falling victim to disease. Become aware of the thoughts you have that support the idea of sickness as something to be expected. Begin noticing the frequency of those thoughts. The more they occupy your mental landscape, the more resistance you're creating to realizing your intention. You know what those thoughts of resistance sound like. I can't do anything about this arthritis. It's the flu season. I feel okay now, but by the weekend it'll be in my chest and I'll have a fever. We live in a carcinogenic world. Everything is either fattening or filled with chemicals. I feel so tired all of the time. On and on and on these thoughts of resistance go. They're like huge barricades blocking the realization of your intentions. Notice the thoughts that represent a decision on your part to buy into the illness mentality of the huge profit-making drug companies and a health care industry that thrives on your fears. But you're the divine, remember? You're a piece of the universal mind of intention. And you don't have to think in these ways. You can opt to think that you have the ability to raise your energy level, even if all of the advertising around you points to a different conclusion. You can go within and hold an intention that says, I want to feel good. I intend to feel good. I intend to return to my source, and I refuse to allow any other thoughts of disorder or disease in. This is the beginning. You'll feel empowered by this unique experience. Then in any given moment of not feeling well, choose thoughts of healing and feeling good. In that instant, feeling good takes over, if only for a few seconds. Illness is not a punishment. You don't have a need for healing because you were bad or ignorant or as retribution for past life offenses. You've taken on 
whatever you're experiencing for whatever lessons you need to learn on this journey, which is being orchestrated by the all-providing intelligence that we're calling intention. In an eternal universe, you must view yourself and all others in infinite terms. Infinite terms means that you have an infinite number of opportunities to show up in a material body to co-create anything. As you view the sickness of the mind and body that permeates your own life as well as the rest of humanity, try viewing it as part of the infinite nature of our world. If starvation, pestilence, or disease are a part of the perfection of the universe, then so is your intention to end these things a part of that same perfection. Now decide to stay with that intention, first in your own life, then in the lives of others. Your intention will match up with the intention of the universe, which knows nothing of egos and separation and all thoughts of illness as punishment and karmic paybacks will cease to exist. You can't heal anyone until you allow yourself to be healed. Connect to a loving, kind, receptive to healing energy, which is the field that intended you here. Be willing to accept the fact that you're a part of the healing energy of all of life. The same force that heals a cut on your hand and grows the new skin to repair it permanently is both in your hand and in the universe as well. You are it. It is you. There's no separation. Be conscious of staying in contact with this healing energy because it's impossible to separate from it except in your ego-diminished thoughts. By raising your energy to a vibrational match with the field of intention, you're strengthening your immune system and increasing the production of well-being enzymes in the brain. A change in personality from being spiteful, pessimistic, angry, sullen, and disagreeable to one of passion, optimism, kindness, joy, and understanding is often the key when witnessing miraculous acts of spontaneous recovery from what were called fatalistic prognostications. Don't ask to be healed. Ask to be restored to that perfection from which you emanated. Let nothing interfere with the intention that you have to heal and be healed. Discard all negativity that you encounter. Refuse to let in any energy that will weaken your body or your resolve. Convey this to others as well. Remember, you're not asking your source to heal you because this assumes health is missing from your life. Come to the source as whole and complete. Banish all thoughts of illness and know that by connecting back to this source, filling yourself with it and offering it to others, you become healing itself. How would we think and act in daily life if we were truly aware of our divine essence? Obviously, there wouldn't be room to reproach yourself because we wouldn't doubt our abilities. In fact, we'd never look in the mirror and feel anything but love and appreciation. We'd see ourselves as fully capable of attracting all we desire. We'd treat our body with reverence and care, giving thanks for its divine design. We'd celebrate every thought we have, knowing its divine origin, and we'd become aware of our enormous talents and be awed by all that we are. We need to encourage the awareness of our magnificence in every regard. When that awareness has been reawakened, the seedlings of inspiration will begin blossoming. Here's a way of expressing these fundamental truths offered by the writings of the Baha'i Faith. This most great, this fathomless and surging ocean is near, astonishingly near, unto you. Behold, it is closer to you than your life vain. Swift as the twinkling of an eye you can, if you but wish it, reach and partake of this imperishable favor, this God-given grace, this incorruptible gift, this most potent and unspeakably glorious bounty. There's no way to be in spirit without a changed awareness. So when we accomplish this, we give ourselves the gift of moving from being flawed, limited, lacking, and imperfect to being completely comfortable with our magnificence. This unspeakably glorious bounty is so close to us, all we have to do is make a few twinkling of an eye adjustments. So why not begin right now? Here are three of the most obvious and important changes in awareness that you can make. 1. Changing the awareness of our magnificent talents and abilities. I want to emphasize an extremely important point. I'm not talking about self-esteem here, nor am I referring to levels of confidence. Rather, I'm saying that we need to keep the important question, who am I, in the forefront of our mind. This question doesn't revolve around previous life experiences, has nothing to do with what we've been told our special qualities or unique abilities are, and it isn't related to how worthy or worthless we feel about ourselves. It has to do with a simple truth. As Epictetus, a philosopher in the first century AD said, you carry a God about within you, poor wretch, and know nothing of it. 
just like Epictetus, who was born into slavery yet became one of our most profound teachers, we came into this world with an inexhaustible supply of talent. Our abilities are as limitless as God's are because we're a distinct portion of the essence of him. And there's an infallible way to begin entertaining those abilities and creating as he does. That way is to become aware that anything that excites us is a clue that we have the ability to pursue it. Anything that truly intrigues us is evidence of a divine, albeit latent, talent that's signaling our awareness. Having an interest in something is the clue to a thought that's connected to our calling. That thought is a vibration of energy in this vast universe. If something really appeals to us and we feel excited but perceive ourselves as devoid of the talent we think is necessary, it's probably an even higher vibration. Anything that's causing excitement within us is evidence of a spirit message that's saying, you can do this, yes, you can. If we react to this message with anything other than, you're correct, I can do this, I have the ability to do it, then we've selected the vibration of resistance and ignored the vibration of excitement and interest that spoke to us. Our thoughts about who we are, what excites us, and what we feel called to be and do are all divinely inspired and come with whatever guidance and assistance we'll need to actualize these goals. The decision at this point is, are we willing to listen to these divine thoughts that pique our interest, or do we go on listening to the false self that's made us what Epictetus called a poor wretch? Rather than case studies of which I have only second-hand knowledge, I'm going to use some examples from my own life that illustrate listening to the false self. My background would appear to be an unlikely one for what I'm calling magnificence. Here's what it would look like on paper. Fathered by an alcoholic who abandoned his three children, childhood years spent in foster homes, a classic underachiever educated in public schools, grew up at the low end of the socioeconomic scale, no financial advantages, no examples of or ambitions for higher education, four years as an enlisted man in the United States Navy, admitted to a university on a provisional acceptance at the age of 22 due to lower than average grades in high school, worked his way through three advanced degrees by being a cashier and a stock boy in a grocery store in Detroit. This isn't exactly what you'd call a prescription for becoming the best-selling author of 28 books and a successful public speaker. I couldn't begin to tell you how many teachers of creative writing and speech gave me low grades for my efforts in these fields. All I can say for certain is that I've always had a knowing about my interest in writing, have always been excited by the prospect of entertaining and informing an audience, any audience. By all of the accepted standards, I didn't have any writing ability. What I did have, and still do, was an interest and a passion for writing. It inspired and thrilled me, and I simply loved it. From the perspective of inspiration, I had the ability to do it, and that's all I needed to know. Then, as now, I trusted that the universe would handle all of the details, including, will I be published? Will the critics approve? Will my book be a bestseller? Will my mother approve? Will I get an apology from any of my old English teachers? But really, who cares about any of this? The fact that writing excites me is all I've ever needed to know. When I follow that thought and stay with it, I conclude that I have the ability and the talent. And so do you. Like me, it's easy to find what excites you. What do you find intriguing? Does learning yoga and becoming an instructor interest you? Then you have your answer. The issue isn't about ability. It's about being matched up in spirit with your current thoughts and behaviors. To change the thought from notice me, notice me, to what Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu calls living in obscurity, becoming more obscure. We live in a uh, celebrity-obsessed world, don't we? Look at me, notice me. The Tao teaches something completely the opposite. Listen to the 66th verse of the Tao. Water again. The sea stays low. And because the sea stays low, all of the rivers and all of the streams empty into it. Because it stays humble. Because it stays in that place of just allowing everything to come to you. He was trying to teach us the important lesson of... Uh, Letting what we know is coming come to us. 
Verse 66 of the Tao. Why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Humility gives it its power. That's a very important principle to understand. And I live on the ocean, right next to it. It's my front yard. And always I watch it to learn something from this thing called the ocean, which is the most powerful source of life that we have on the planet. Without it, there's no life on this planet. And because it stays low, so what does this have to say to us? Do you have the capacity to get past that ego need to always be saying, notice me, look how important I am. I mean, there's been a proliferation of this lately with this celebrity silly stuff, isn't it? I mean, CNN is doing, you know, full hour shows on, uh, on silly little things about what happened to this particular celebrity or what happened to that celebrity, and the celebrity's never even done anything. And it's, uh, there's all of this talk about it. And all of the new magazines, I mean, and you look, you go into, through an airport and you look on the newsstand and all the same photos, just with different magazines. I don't even know what, what the names of all of them are, but there's like this huge market now that we have for people to get into a state of notice me, notice me, notice me. And how much do we train our young people, particularly in our schools and so on, that the one who is the star is the one who gets the most attention. The one who is uh, the most important and the most valuable is the one that has uh, the most people liking them and so on. This constant obsession with needing to be noticed. When in fact, what I have found for myself is the the happiest moments of my life are when I can do it low and slow and not have anybody out there even know what I'm doing. To be able to, I mean, Louise never would have uh, advertised the fact of some of the things I talk about with her generosity. She does it anonymously. It's almost always done in those ways. No, look at me, look and notice me, how important I am and so on. So much to learn from that kind of wisdom, from that kind of inner connection to the Tao, the ability and the willingness to say, to do it anonymously, to say that you can just get done almost anything that you want to get done if you don't become obsessed with taking credit for it. In the 36th verse of the Tao Te Ching, it says, the gentle outlast the strong, the obscure outlast the obvious. Try to become a little more obscure, a little less interfering, a little less notice me, a little less, you know, one of the specific kinds of things that you can do is just as you're about, when somebody else is talking, just as you're about to interject what you've been thinking about for the whole time, waiting for them to stop talking, <laughs> just as you, to just stop and to bite your tongue and say, tell me more, or that's very interesting. I have never heard that point of view before. Even if they totally, completely disagree with everything that you stand for, to be, to be willing to listen, to be able to stop, practice it. I practiced it when I did these verses of the Tao. I practiced it every single day while I was working on that. Just staying obscure. And for me, that's not always so easy because of just being recognized wherever I go. And if I saw someone who was about to recognize me, I would just put my head down. I would just walk a little bit past them like something. Right now, I just want to be anonymous. Right now, I want to be obscure. The Tao says, storms always end. Verse 23, fierce winds don't blow all morning. A downpour of rain doesn't last all day. Who does this? Heaven and earth. You're already connected to everything you want or need. It will come to you at the exact perfect time as the rivers and the streams come to the ocean at the perfect time and place you gotta trust you gotta know it's going to come to you you don't have to chase after it you can become a little less obsessed with your ego and your self-importance and who you are and what you've done and you can get so much more done and you know what it's the most peaceful and sweet delicious way it's like the song that Cecilia was singing about the rose. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. Line by uh, Albert Einstein. 
when he was talking to his students about trying to solve mathematical problems and equations. He said, you can't ever solve a problem with the same mind that created it. It's, it's what they call sometimes in management circles, uh, thinking outside of the dots or outside of the box, getting out of your comfort zone, getting out of um, looking at things the way you've always looked at them and having a different kind of an awareness. I came across this quote not too long ago. Moving away the clouds does not make the sunshine. It merely reveals what was hidden all along. The sunshine, the sun is always there. And you don't make it shine by just taking things away. There's something inside all of us that is hidden. And it's the ability to, uh, I call it rewriting our agreement with reality. It requires a new kind of awareness, a different a willingness, if you will, to, uh, to see yourself as potentially capable of virtually anything. I've always loved the observation from the New Testament of, of Jesus that even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. That within each and every one of us there is this ability to, to be healers. There's this ability to be able to manifest and attract anything into our lives that we put our attention on. There's this ability to live at such a high level of consciousness that we can uh, transcend our bodies. My internal wiring has always been one of uh, whatever it is that I've got in my life as a problem that I have to take responsibility for it, but I also have the capacity to be able to change it. And not only to change around what it is that is not working for me, but also to change around what I have been attracting into my life. I think it begins with this, uh, this whole idea of, uh, of being inspired. I've always liked that word, inspired, inspiration, because its origin is in spirit. And then the opposite word is uh, uh, being informed. And so when you're in form, in the physical world, when you're in form, you get information, you get lots of information. And this is what we call the information age, right? So there's no shortage of information. They say that on a, a little chip the size of your thumbnail, we can put the names and addresses of everybody in the United States and Canada on, on a little chip the size of your thumbnail. That's really more information, I think, than we need. <laughs> What we are doing is we are moving from the age of information to the age of inspiration, I believe. And as we move into the age of inspiration, where collectively mankind is beginning to have uh, a collective capacity to be able to think thoughts which empower us rather than which weaken us, which, uh, according to Hawkins' research, uh, up until about 1985 or 1986, collectively, mankind's collective thoughts uh, always produced uh, that which weakens us. And now, in the last few years, we have moved above the level uh, where man's collective consciousness is uh, at least at a place where collectively we are empowering ourselves rather than uh, using force. And as we move into the world of inspiration, we have to understand what that means. And Patanjali had a wonderful observation. I wrote about it in Wisdom of the Ages. He said, when you are inspired, that is, in spirit, and remember, it is in the world of spirit, it is in the world of thoughts where we change, where we go to the place where we create anything we want for ourselves in our lives. So that remembering here, the theme is that you can't solve any problem that you might have in your life with the same mind that created it.
So you're moving into a place now called spirit. That which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. We're moving into the world of the invisible now. When you are inspired, and think about the moments in your life when you've had the most inspiration, inspirado. You, you lose any touch of fatigue. I have gone and been inspired at moments in my life when uh, I have written for almost 24 straight hours without stopping, without, without eating, without uh, thinking about sleep. I just got into one of those modes, you know, what the, we call a zone sometimes, where everything just flowed. When you are in that place, you, you transcend everything. And you don't think about, you don't worry about whether people are going to call you or not call you. You don't worry about your children. You don't worry about being sick. You don't think about the cold that you might have. You don't think about being tired and how much sleep you'll need. When you're inspired, you're in spirit. When you're in spirit, you're connected to your source. And now what you're doing is you're moving out of the mindset of inform or information, which is where all problems occur in the world of the physical, and you're shifting into the world of spirit. The softer you are, the less rigid you are, the more flexible you are as a person, the more you can accomplish. And this is a great way to practice in parenting as well. And this idea that a rigid thought how many times have you heard this idea that if I tell you something, I'm going to stay consistent with it. We have a set of rules, these are the rules, and we'll do it this way. In the Tao it says the more rules you make, the more rule breakers you create. <laughs> it's true. The more rules you have in your house about how everything has to go. We had in our house, my wife would have a big jar of M&Ms. Peanuts, you know, different, they, with all these different multicolored ones. And, so, and the kids in our house, because we didn't feed them sugar and we didn't give them sodas and stuff like that. So they, you know, they were just more like a decoration. Every once in a while someone would take them. They'd hardly ever be replaced. Now when we had kids come over to our house who weren't ever allowed to have such horrible things, you should have seen their behavior. You know, they would scoop them up, they'd be putting them in their pockets, and they'd get their purses, and they'd open it up. And, you know, the whole thing would be empty. I'd say, well, what are you doing? He said, well, well you, you mean you could just have these whenever you want them? I said, well, we don't really have any rules about that. It's just, uh, uh, it's not something that we encourage or discourage. It's just there. It's like Emerson had a wonderful line. He said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. A foolish consistency, a rigid consistency. So that there are many people who will say, if I say it on Monday, you can be absolutely certain that on Wednesday I'm going to believe the same thing, regardless of what might happen on Tuesday. <laughs> now Tuesday might have something real that you might want to be changing your mind. You might want to say, you know, I thought that this time, but now I've seen this, and now we can shift. And you can see how this can become when, and so much about the Tao is on leadership. Leadership in the family, leadership in the community, leadership geopolitically. Less rigidity, more openness, more willingness to listen and say, I changed my mind. <laughs> because a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And what I believed on Wednesday has changed because of what happened on Tuesday. Now, another important thing to say to your children, to your friends, to your lover, to your spouses, to whomever, to the people you work with, words that we're so terrified to say, but which give us a sense of living with the Tao. I don't know. I don't know. I'll look it up. Say it. I don't know. It doesn't hurt. Say it again. I don't know. Isn't it fearful? I mean, so many people, and it's like very freeing, because my kids call, ask me something, and I say, I don't know. <laughs> they say, Dad, you know everything. You know everything. I say, well, I don't know that, and uh, I'll look it up, or we'll try to find an answer to that, but I don't quite know. I know that um, wh even, you know, I spent 20 years running and I ran every day for 20 years, for 22 years, without missing a day, eight miles. 
never missed a day. That's rigid, all right? Some call that obsessive. <laughs> but you brush your teeth every day, I used to say, and you don't call that obsessive. And uh, you go to the bathroom every day, and you don't say, well, he's obsessively doing that again today. You don't do that. You just... But anyway, what I learned is that in, even in the world of exercise, there are certain things that are built in to make us rigid, to make us stiff, to make us hard. And we lift, and we run, and we kick, and uh, we, this is what we call working out. There's another kind of working out that is ancient. It goes back to the time of Lao Tzu and before, which is called yoga. And yoga means union. It means union with your source. And when you do yoga, you can stay in the same place. You can do the equivalent of eight miles. When I used to run eight miles, I had to run four miles that way, turn around four miles back. <laughs> And I'd be sweating. Now I can do yoga, and I can just stand in one place. And in 90 minutes, by being supple, by making myself stretch, by not being hard and rigid, I can, you know, I can get that out there. I can get that leg up. I can do these kinds of things. And 90, and 90 minutes later, you know, it's like I'm totally sweating, and so, and I feel so different. I used to, when I would go out at night to eat or something after running so many miles, running marathons and doing those things, I'd go to get up, and it would be okay. It's going to take a little while, because right? everything was so like that. That doesn't happen anymore, because I've given up hard. I've given up being rigid and substituted it for being supple, for being flexible, for living a life in which I don't have to always be so fierce. Listen to this verse of the Tao Te Ching. It's one of my all-time favorites, verse number 76. A man is born gentle and weak. At his death, he becomes hard and stiff. All things, including the grass and the trees, are soft and pliable in life, dry and brittle in death. Stiffness is thus a companion in death. Flexibility is a companion in life. And it's not just for how you exercise. It's how you think, how you think. In order to cultivate your witness, you need to learn to observe your reactions in order to go beyond them. It is the going beyond that is the crux of the sacred quest. There are many ways that you can use the observation process. Here are a couple of them that are very important. The first is observing your body. This is one of the areas of being the witness that most of us have practiced somewhat. In general, we allow our body to function without interference. We are aware that there is the body and that there is a ghost in the machine, if you will. For as long as you can remember, you have been observing this phenomenon of a body. It is also true that you know that the entity that is doing the observing is removed in some dramatic way from that which it is witnessing. As you are listening to these words, you are allowing your body to act out its destiny without your meddling. You are not busy beating your heart or filling your lungs or oxygenating your blood supply or circulating your vital fluids. You allow your body to operate itself, and you allow another part of you to know the way of being the divine, quiet, non-interfering observer. This way has served you well. By just observing your body and detaching yourself from its functioning, it works as perfectly as it was ordained to. If you were constantly monitoring and attempting to control your bodily functions, you would be unduly attached to its outcome, and you would inhibit its natural functions. The times in your life when you worry or interfere with the natural functions of your body are the times when you find it breaking down. Feed your body the wrong foods and it will respond with lethargy and disease. Fail to exercise it and it will become overweight and groggy. Ignore its needs for fresh air and healthy environment and it will fall into disrepair. Feed it narcotic substances or artificial drugs and it will react with violent symptoms. When your body is in any state of disrepair, from being overweight to having back pains or nervousness or influenza or cancer, or anything that is not the way of perfect health that your body knows at the cellular and genetic levels, then you are being called back to the position of loving witness. The second way of observing is called observing your mind. Your mind is filled with thousands of thoughts every day. They come and they go like trains in a terminal. One enters, another takes its place, one exits, and along comes another. First you want to watch your thoughts, then you want to watch yourself watching your thoughts. Here is the door to the inner space where, free from all thoughts, 
you experience the bliss and the freedom that transport you directly to your higher self. The simple exercise of watching your mind manufacturing its thoughts will eventually cause unwanted, unnecessary, erroneous thoughts to dissolve. In the process of cultivating the witness, you learn to quiet your mind, to take inventory, and dispose of or reassign thoughts that generate self-defeating or ego-centered responses. In this simple process, you also come to know your spiritual self. Ego-generated thoughts play a huge role in creating the world that the ego wishes to create. Each of my thoughts seem to demand it be considered the most important. Troubles begin with a thought that you put into your mind and allow it to fester to the point of anxiety. The anxiety begins to manifest in your life in physically destructive ways, which we call things like arthritis, high blood pressure, and career cardiacs. The loving, non-judgmental energy received from the observer or the witness will allow these thoughts to flow in and out as naturally as the ocean tides. Tides in, tides out. Thoughts in, thoughts out. You will learn to be a witness to your thoughts in the same way that you observe the tide. And the process will cleanse and redistribute and remove thoughts in much the same way as the driftwood on the beach. What remains is generally quite pleasing. Witnessing your thoughts will take some practice. With proficiency comes wonder and delight. Trauma is dissolved in the thinking stage and prevented from manifesting into your everyday world. Begin to notice the noticer. As you take note of your worlds, both inner and outer, begin to familiarize yourself with the noticer who is behind that which is being noticed. If you do this several times each day, you will begin to see that you are much more than just a body and mind going through the program motions of your life. Your realization of your true self as the witness behind that which is being witnessed will bring you a new dimension of creativity and bliss. Try on this exercise. Think of something that has been bothering you for a long period of time. Now go to a quiet place and close your eyes. Just see the problem surfacing on the blank screen in your consciousness. Notice all aspects of the problem, what it looks like, when it shows up, what you feel when it is on your mind, the pain and the fear that you have when it is present, how you have dealt with it unsuccessfully in the past. Think of everything that you can which is related to the problem. Then, detach yourself in your mind from the problem. Just allow it to sit there on the screen of your mind. Look at it from the viewpoint of the compassionate witness who just non-judgmentally notices the screen. Watch it like a movie, allowing it to change in whatever way it does. Just observe it with loving permission for it to do whatever it wants to do. You will see it change and fade in and out of awareness. With each change or movement on the screen, remain in the caring witness mode of knowing the energy will do what it will and will also be accompanied by the loving energy from the witness. Often, just this act of observation will result in a feeling of the problem having dissipated. If that happens, observe that also from the position of caring observer. I once practiced this act of observation when I was injured and unable to play tennis. I reacted at first to the pain in my foot with statements like, this injury is keeping me from doing what I want to do and I'm really upset about it. I found that no matter what I tried, the pain persisted and I was unable to pivot and consequently had to discontinue an activity that I loved. I then took the witness stance. I no longer saw myself as having an injury. I attributed the pain only to my body and not to me. I witnessed the entire thing and merely watched it. I lovingly witnessed the pain, the way it showed up, my feelings of frustration about it, the color of the swelling, everything. But I refused to think of it as mine. It was only my body's problem. The very same day that I did this, the entire discomfort disappeared. I mean, it was gone from my body. I had put my attention on what was occurring and detached myself from it. And in what seemed like a few hours, I no longer had the pain and I was playing tennis as if I had never experienced any injury at all. In order to know the benefit of witnessing, you will have to banish the doubt about this as something that will work for you. Remember, you have been conditioned to believe that your body is the essence of your humanity. You've been taught to tackle problems with your physical and intellectual apparatus, not your higher self. Practice new self-talk sentences to replace your old identification with your physical body. I am that which owns this body. I am not the body itself. I can't be reached if you come to me with hatred or anger. I cannot worry when I refuse to be the worrier and simply observe that worrier and the worries. Self-talk sentences will keep you centered on your spiritual domain. You will find that many things that you worried about or experienced in a negative fashion are slowly beginning to diminish from your life. Let's go for a moment to our dream. 
And just assume that we're going to have a dream. We're in bed. And let me ask you this question. This is a question I like to ask for you to just contemplate, one of those sort of cones. When you go to sleep at night and enter your dream state, what happens to the bed? Just think about that. What happens to the bed? Now you're in your dream. Okay? So just propel yourself into a dream state. And in your dream, you notice, oh, let's say you're over here, and you're in a room. And in this room, you look across the room, and you notice that there's a podium in the room. And it has some objects on it. Now you're in your dream. So in the state of dream consciousness, you say to yourself, I would like to examine that podium more closely. How do you do it in your dream? How do you examine it more closely in your dream state? Do you get out of bed? Is there a bed? Now, we're talking about one-third of your life here, folks, okay? One-third of your life. As Lao Tzu said, I went to sleep and dreamt that I was a butterfly. Then I woke up, and now I don't know. Am I a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly who's dreaming that he's a man? <laughs> So in your dream state, do you get up out of bed, keep it right over there, say, excuse me, honey, uh, wait, uh, get up, and walk over and say, oh, here, oh, there's a galley of a new book, and there's a pen here, and there's a glass of water, I think I'll have a drink of that. There's a microphone stand, there's things. Do you do that? No, you don't do that. Because you enter your dream without any doubt. So what you do in your dream state is, are you ready? Shoo! Stay alert. <laughs> and you bring it to you, don't you? In your dream state. Why? Because you have the power of your intention, can have an idea, and whatever you need for the fulfillment of your dream, you bring to you. Here it is. Here it is. Whatever you need. So you're 20 years old in your dream. And you need a jerk to be married to for the next 20 years? There he is. <laughs> Isn't that great? You need a Maserati? There it is. Whatever you need for the dream, you bring to it. Then you leave the dream and you come into waking consciousness. And now you look back on the dream and you now have a whole new set of things that you've introduced. And that set of things is called doubt. And the second key to higher awareness which I'll get to shortly, is called banishing the doubt, but it's, it's connected here. As you enter your dream state, you enter without any doubt about your capacity to do anything. So you can fly, you can jump over trees, you can be young again, you can uh, transcend death, you can stay underwater, you can, do, you can communicate telepathically with anyone that you want to, right? You have all of these incredible powers. And if someone has died and you want them back, you bring them back. If you need to be 12 again, and then you come into this state and you say, I can't do any of those things because you're stuck in paradigms. And the paradigm says, you cannot change your shape. You can't shape shift. If you're a certain age, you're a certain age. You can't move yourself into, you can't be in more than one place at the same time, which you can do in your dream easily. You can't do those things. And one of the things I talk about in your sacred self is like learning to become a waking dreamer, to understand that you don't have to go to sleep in order to dream. So now you wake up, and what I'm suggesting to you is that this is also a dream, only it's a hundred-year dream. And in this hundred-year dream, everything that you can do in your eight-hour dream, you can do in this hundred-year dream. Everything. If you know better than to doubt it. And if you get rid of the paradigms that muck up your life. You have the capacity. But the minute that you introduce doubt into it, like that poem that I started out, Real Magic, which is really my effort to write about how to manifest miracles in your life, from Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he said, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven? 
And there picked a strange and wonderful flower. And what if when you awoke, you held that flower in your hand? Ah, what then? Is it possible to bring something from a dream state into a waking state? Or is that part of a paradigm? And the tiniest smidgen of doubt that enters your consciousness is what you will act upon. Seven key little words from Proverbs, as you think, so shall you be. If you think that it's not possible, what you think about is what expands. Or as Emerson said, the, at the ancestor to every action is a thought. And the minute you have a doubtful thought in your consciousness, you will act upon that and manifest the fruit of that doubt and not be able to see it. You will not see it.